Thank you all for attending, uh, even though the seats are comfortable. If you could just bear with me for the next 50 or so minutes and listen to what I've got to say. So my title, I think my, my bill title was Genomic Epidemiology in Southeast Asia. And I've added this, um, a tale of two cities to tell you about two different epidemiological um, questions that we've been addressing through genomics in two different locations. I'm not a public health expert, I'm not a clinician, in fact I wouldn't even call myself an epidemiologist, I'm a molecular microbiology and now with the advance of sequencing techniques uh, it really is opening up new avenues to study pathogens uh, in endemic environments and I have an interest in a number of different enteric pathogens and we apply a number of different techniques to understand them. So, <clears throat> one of the first things I want to show is a picture of a man, so we all know what a man is. Uh, I quite like this because uh, we often consider science to be completely uh, derived from human beings' approach. If we're realistic, we actually live in a microbial world and man, men, women, children, animals are purely just vectors for moving microbes around and have been for millions of years and will be for millions of years to come when humans are extinct. So actually, even though we think we're very important, actually microbes control the world. Bacteria. I often get asked why I'm interested in working on bacteria. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues once sat me down over a beer and said, why do you want to work on shit? And I said, well, I want to work on shit because it's interesting and there's plenty to do. There's a lot we don't know. And in fact, just to put this into context, as compared to the human population, 100 trillion organisms, in each one of us in our gastrointestinal tract, there's 100 trillion organisms circulating. And actually, for the amount of information that we have on these, we don't know what all of these are doing at all of the time. So there's quite a lot of uh, area uh, or investigation that we could follow up, particularly with new techniques, to understand what's going on with these 100 trillion organisms within inside our guts. This constitutes about 1% to 3% of our total body weight. So whether you like it or not, between a th uh, 1 and 3% of your total body weight is actually bacterial biomass. So, as for mentioned, this is, I will say shit again. I do apologise because I'm on video, but this is a picture of one. 60% of the dry weight of faecal matter is actually bacteria. So this is an enormous uh, uh, population of organisms that are circulating in this environment. And actually, that whether we also we like it or not, that we often come in contact with bacteria that are in faecal matter on a fairly regular basis, cause of gastrointestinal infections. All of you have had gastrointestinal infections, and most commonly, this has come from contracting it from something that's come in common with, uh, with faecal matter. This obviously is a much bigger problem in developing countries where exposure to faecal matter through uh, contaminated environments and access to everything that we take for granted on a daily basis, clear drinking water is a big problem. So 780 million people worldwide don't have access to regular clean water supplies. Uh, two and a half billion people worldwide do not have access to sustained sanitation systems. And there's about 1.7 billion, an estimated 1.7 billion cases of enteric infections worldwide uh, every year. So just to put that into context a bit, being as you're all public health experts, that enteric diseases, uh, even though they may not attract most of the publicity of some of the other bigger infections, enteric diseases are a huge problem, not only in the US and in Europe through contamination of faecal matter into animal products into food, but also in mainly in developing countries. This is a picture that I liked. I really like reading The Economist when I travel, so I sit on aeroplanes and read The Economist. This is a nice article about how mankind has suddenly run out of ideas of things to invent. And actually the toilet was actually defined as one of mankind's greatest inventions and greatest innovations. In fact, it's completely true. If you actually look at what happened to a number of different enteric infections on the, the verge of sanitation, the introduction of the flush toilet, for those of you working in public health, I'm sure you'll disagree, but actually the toilet is the biggest ever medical intervention in history. Okay, so let's talk about the pathogens that infect our gastrointestinal tract. Gastrointestinal tract is a particularly harsh environment, travelling through the low pH of the stomach, and the pathogens uh, uh, such as Helicobacter pylori colonise and can cause stomach uh, ulcers and various other things. Upper gastrointestinal tract, a range of different um, uh, uh, organisms, the pathogenic E. coli, Salmonella, Vibrio cholerae, Yersinia, 
and then down into the lower intestine, particularly Shigella and Campylobacter. Different pHs, different environments, different organisms, often different syndromes. Different genetic diversity of the organisms which explain to some extent the disease they cause and the way they circulate. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about Salmonella and also something else that I'm working on at the moment, Shigella. Um, all the others we do tend to work on in different components. Uh, or if you look at a diarrhea or you investigate diarrhea in any circumstances, then it will be possible to study any one of these without taking the others into context. And also viruses and also parasites. So, a tale of two cities. I live here in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, which at one time was called Saigon. And I spend a little bit of time going backwards and forwards to the capital uh, of, Ka of Nepal, which is Kathmandu. This is about um, a three-hour flight, but you have to stop in between, so it takes a bit of tra travelling time. This is uh, our unit uh, on a very nice day in Ho Chi Minh City. This is our hospital. It's the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and it's a southern referral hospital uh, for a number of different infections um, of known and unknown etiology. And in contrast, this is the emergency department and a new um, birthing uh, wing at our hospital in, in Kathmandu. So, something I'm going to talk a little bit about today, Samalala Typhi. Ac access to uh, clean water in Nepal is, is limited. There's an overwhelming population growth within the city and very poor infrastructure, and it facilitates the circulation of this bacteria, which is my favourite bacteria, even though it sounds nerdy to say it. This is my favourite bacteria. In contrast, Ho Chi Minh City is also a developing environment, but developing in a much uh, more rapid pace. It looks like any other pretty much big city. Still some sol uh, signs of old Saigon with uh, people transporting ducks on the back of their bike. In fact, this is the photograph that everybody shows when they're talking about H5N1. And norovirus is now the major cause or one of the major causes of hospitalized uh, diarrhea in Ho Chi Minh City. Over a period of time, due to improvements in sanitation, the old pathogens that we may consider to be important, Vibrio cholera and such like, have actually diminished and now they're being replaced with the type of pathogens that we see more frequently in the West. So I run a research group. Um, I'm not a clinician, I'm a scientist, but we work with clinical groups to address all of these particular areas. Antimicrobial resistance is a massive issue, not only here in the US, but also in developing countries. We perform a, a series of treatment trials to try and counteract the effects of antimicrobial resistance. Epidemiology to try and understand the infections, more uh, prevention. By, um, we've recently had a paper published looking at modeling interventions with uh, typhoid vaccines. Host genetics, so with every study that we design, we also collect and get ethics for doing, uh, collecting um, host DNA. And we've actually identified recently uh, two um, genes that are associated with susceptibility to typhoid fever. I'm not an immunologist either, um, but we do uh, spend some time studying the immune response and I have a very good collaboration with Phil's group here that are helping us do some of that work. Pathogen genetics is something that probably we're the strongest in. Um, my background is in genomics, so we spend a lot of time looking at DNA and also developing diagnostics. Probably the most underrated and probably one of the most important aspects of studying and developing an infrastructure to understand infectious diseases. Okay, so the first story. Typhoid fever. We've had an interest in a unit for typhoid fever. I've been working on typhoid fever about the last 15 years. Particularly pathogen evolution and dynamics, epidemiology and transmission, and also treatments. Just to demonstrate what we've done in the past, we've conducted the largest ever uh, clinical trials in enteric fever. Uh, we were the first group ever to combine genomics and mapping to study the epidemiology of the organism, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And also we, with drug resistance, we've studied uh, how fluoroquinolones are having a dramatic effect on changing the bacterial population. And our work has led to uh, them actually changing the, uh, the fluoroquinolone breakpoints for people that do and don't get treated with fluoroquinolones when they have acute typhoid fever. We're currently defining blueprints for how um, enteric fever treatment trials should be done in the future. We're, um, Studying uh, Paratyphi A genomics, so Paratyphi A is a similar organism to Typhi. It causes the same disease, but we don't know a lot about it genetically. And there are different questions with the way it interacts with the host. We're working on developing next generation diagnostics. And we're also we're working with groups at Oxford and, and Novartis to try and look at the effects of next generation vaccines as well. So a bit, a bit about the disease. It's caused by the bacteria Salmonella typhi, although there are alternative infections caused by Salmonella paratyphi cerevars. It's fecally or is then transmitted. 
Uh, we have limited good data on incidents because it's difficult to get because the diagnostics are so bad. Uh, it's popular in undeveloped and developing countries, particularly parts of Asia, and are now spreading into parts of sub-Saharan Africa quite rapidly. Humans are the only known reservoir, which is a very, very important factor for understanding how to control the infection. Because there's no animal reservoir, if we can tackle it in humans, we can develop good vaccines, we can diagnose it, actually, that theoretically we could eliminate it relatively quickly. And this story about asymptomatic shedding, so all of you will have heard of somebody called Typhoid Mary. This is the classical case of typhoid, where somebody has typhoid and then goes on to shed it for a long time and become a carrier. The infection cycle, the dogma goes that a carrier, this is the gallbladder, gallbladders aren't that, that big for those of you who are medically changed, this is just to demonstrate the picture. A gallbladder inflamed with salmonella living in it, transmitted to other humans, into either water or food. All of these people will have got exposed. Uh, the ones in red will have gone on to get a severe infection, the ones in blue a mild infection, and the, the ones that are uncoloured would have had an asymptomatic infection. We don't really understand how this correlates with people getting sick or not getting sick. We don't really have any good markers of protective immunity, but we do know that probably a lot of people are exposed and a lot of people don't get sick. What we do know is, though, that even in an endemic environment, there is some level of protection from being exposed. We don't know, really know how long that lasts for. Uh, we don't really know what it correlates with, but we know that once you've lived in an environment for a period of time where the organism circulates, there is evidence that you have antibodies to it, and we think that that probably gives you some form of relatively long-term protection. Obviously, this is slightly compounded by the fact, I do apologise for the hat, um, this is slightly confounded by tourists travelling to endemic locations without any immunisation and actually that typhoid is one of the, the biggest um, problems for tourists travelling to Nepal or India and actually contracting the infection. So if you do travel to India or Nepal or other places, make sure you have a typhoid vaccine before you go. So, we've performed a GIS study, so geographical information systems for those of you that don't know what GIS stands for. We wanted to know what the main factors were for transmission of typhoid in Nepal. We wanted to know if actually where you lived in the city changes your risk and do specific genotypes, haplotypes we call them in the organ of salmonella typhi circulate and how do they circulate. So what we did, we household, we went round and I was very popular for this. We sent a number of uh, research assistants round and we used GPS uh, devices to map the houses of the cases and a number of controls that were controlling for the population entering our hospital. We studied the local pattern of diseases and we um, came up with some epidemiological factors that we thought were important for infection. We genotyped all of the salmonella typhi and we identified the dominant organisms and then we studied the temporal and spatial haplotype patterns. So basically what we did is we collected organisms, uh, we did some genomics to understand what organisms were circulating and then related them back to the time and the location they were isolated from. So this is what we got, first of all, this is our primary data set. Uh, blue here is Salmonella paratyphi, uh, red here is Salmonella typhi, um, the line here is rainfall, so you can see there's a quite a nice association with wet weather. And then when we put this information back onto a map, you get a nice Google Earth map. Again, red, typhi, blue, Salmonella paratyphi. And you can see, you get a nice pretty picture. So you get red and blue dots on a map telling you that actually you get quite a lot of typhoid in this, this area, a little bit less over here. Okay, so it doesn't tell us a huge amount, but it does tell us actually that's fairly well concentrated into a particular small area here and possibly over here. So then using some relatively sophisticated uh, spatial statistics, controlling uh, cases um, for the population density and other variables that were uh, people attending our local healthcare centre, we created two different heat maps. The top one is for typhi. The bottom one is for Salmonella paratyphi A. The red, or the, the hot point, is the area uh, where we have the highest spatial risk of getting typhoid, and here the highest spatial risk of getting paratyphoid. And you can see there's fairly substantial overlap between the two. The majority of cases are the highest spatial risk. This here is essentially a, 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 an odds ratio for uh, their ability to, to uh, be infected with the organism. It's higher in the kind of north east area of the city. We mapped then all of the local water sources that we think or we hypothesized were associated with transmitting the organism around the city. So people collect their water from wells and various other uh, water spouts uh, three times a day, the women and the children while the men stay at home, 
collect the water, bring it back to the household, and that water is then used for uh, cooking and drinking rare surfings. So we mapped those locations, and we found that with high significance, that people living closer to the wells were more likely to get typhi and, and paratyphia, meaning your proximity to a municipal water spout meant that you were more likely or had a higher risk of getting the infection. And then, rather obviously, if you do the same for elevation, we found that typhi patients live three point, on average 3.27 meters lower and S, S paratyphia infection 3.78 meters lower than controls, meaning also the lower elevation that you live in in the city, uh, the more risk you have of getting infection. So, some relatively basic statistics, some relatively obvious findings that, that if you live lower in the city, you're more likely to be exposed to contaminated water and you're more likely to use the water or come in contact with people that use the water where the organism is circulating. So then we went on and did some genotyping. This is a fairly basic phylogenetic tree of uh, the known structure of the organism of Salmonella typhi. This is a bar chart down here with a scale across the bottom. And our red dots were the haplotypes that we, we isolated. So obviously we didn't isolate them all. Uh, we isolated only about 25 different haplotypes, but the majority of them were in this particular group, this H58 group. And this particular group is very important because it's the strain that's going through a rapid clonal expansion at the moment. Are you willing to take questions? I'll take some questions at the end. Okay. okay. Um, so this particular strain is very important um, because it's associated with fluoroquinolone resistance and we believe it's spreading across Asia and into Europe, into Africa, sorry. And then what we did is put this information back onto the map and then did some more statistics. So this is the same map that you saw before with colours highlighting the different or the most important haplotypes that we found in the area. And what we found is that the chance of your location, the chance of you living in a certain area changed your risk of getting infection. However, once you were infected, the chance of you getting uh, infected with an organism was completely random, suggesting that because it's been transmitted through the municipal water source, or that's what we believe, uh, then you're essentially spinning the roulette wheel every time you get sick, and instead of there being transmission chains uh, within your household or being exposed to carriers, actually you're more likely to get uh, sick with any organism that's circulating in the population. The one exception was this particular area, a uh, relatively small area, only of a, a few hundred square metres. Uh, this B4 correlates with a particular uh, subgenotype, and we found that over a period of about three to six months, we had about 25 infections with this particular organism in one location, and we believe this was a single source outbreak that occurred over a period of time and then disappeared. However, all the rest were completely randomly distributed. And to take that a little bit further, I mentioned this particular dogma about typhoid carriage and also local transmission. The understanding is that if I get sick, then I'm more likely to uh, pass it on to the people in close proximity within my house. This here is uh, broken down into quarters over 2006, 7 and 8. And the different dots correspond with different genotypes and that the, the numbers correspond with different households over time. And you can count them. The lines correspond uh, with house households where we got the same genotype. And actually, we only, we only found about six households where you could isolate the same genotype more than once. And when you do the analysis on this, it does demonstrate that there is an association potentially with having some acute transmission within the household. However, still, you're more likely to get infected with a random organism, suggesting that even if you live in a household with a primary typhoid case, you're still more likely to get sick with a different genotype. So what are we doing? This is the main problem. We've done some work uh, looking at fecal contamination in the water and also looking at the chemical composition of the water. Uh, we find that the water is incredibly contaminated, not only uh, with fecal runoff, but also with a range of other chemicals. And actually, we've done some analyses looking at these different uh, water locations. We can stratify them by different chemical compositions. This is a principal components analysis. Uh, we can break it down into the fact that different water sources have different uh, chemical signatures, meaning that the, we think that the different water sources have very, very specific uh, chemical compositions, which is related to local contamination, either through uh, uh, chemical leakage or through breakdown of biological matter. I apologise for the spelling here. I have a French collaborator who doesn't know how to spell properly. Um, this is, a, again, uh, um, a, a principal component analysis stratified by date. Uh, we took the water samples uh, from these locations, so we looked at 10 different locations 
and then we stratified them by date and then we performed the quantitative PCR to look for Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi A in the water and what you can find is that over a period of time particularly uh, around April 2009, this is a year-long study, uh, we find peaks and, and also troughs of our ability to detect the, auto, of the, the organism in the water, demonstrating there's a seasonal signature uh, where we can detect the organism in the water and then it seems to disappear. And this correlates quite nicely uh, with our ability to um, find patients in the hospital with the infection. So clearly the environment is playing a huge role here and it's something we don't really understand. And this is something else that we don't really understand an incredibly complex data set looking at the flora or the, the, the microbiota circulating in those water uh, samples over a period of 12 months. And again, the belief is that if you take a water sample uh, longitudinally from a particular location, often you find the same signatures of the same organisms present in them all the time. And actually, we do see that occasionally. So this is broken down again by, by, by weeks. So occasionally, we seem to see particular signatures, say this particular uh, group here that we can see is a, uh, there circulating for three weeks, but then it disappears. And actually what this demonstrates is that we don't really see any correlation between our ability to detect or not detect the organisms in the water that are, we're interested in infections and, and how that correlates with different microbiota. So the message here is the fact that when we look at these things, we have to take them into context how complex these systems are. So the ecology of these water sample uh, uh, systems within Nepal are so diverse, not only for our ability to detect pathogens, but also circulating flora from either from fecal waste or from the environment, that we don't really understand how the, all these things are interacting to facilitate the spread of the organism. So what are we doing now? So Rather than come up with a multitude of additional kind of interesting techniques to study what's going on, we're going to go back to basics and we're about to introduce the sand-based um, water filter into people's households and hopefully if we get funded or find out later this year that we'll be randomising 400 children into receiving a sand-based uh, water filter for a period of 12 months, measuring seroconversion to a range of different enteric pathogens. Uh, looking at how that influences their um, uh, disease, whether they get enteric infections, but also studying the microbiota of these individuals. If, what is the pressure that's put on the, not only on the organisms, but also on the immune development, on various other things, by drinking contaminated and uncontaminated water? So hopefully by randomizing two different groups, we can study changes in microflora through children that are being exposed and hopefully less exposed to gastrointestinal pathogens. Okay, so that's half. I'm halfway through. This is my second part of my talk. This is going back to my earlier slide. This is Ho Chi Minh City. Um, I showed you a picture of it earlier as a kind of urban kind of sprawl and, and developing. It, it is. There are still some areas around the city uh, that perhaps people would like to ignore, but there are still certain urban slums. Uh, still canals uh, circulating the city that seem to be um, heavily associated with diarrheal diseases and also fecal contamination. So this uh, is something, thankfully, that didn't hit us. This is Hurricane or Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines in November. Vietnam is teetering on the edge of being a very, very successful middle-income country and a lower income developing country. And actually uh, these uh, natural disasters um, pose a serious threat for Vietnam over the next 20 to, 20 to 30 to 50 years. So actually Haiyan missed us and actually went up and hit uh, China up here. But actually this was the forecast on the 8th of November that it was actually gonna hit Vietnam uh, sometime in the evening uh, on, the, on the 9th of November and thankfully it missed because even though the infrastructure is better than, than it probably was in the Philippines, that we're still at risk from this type of infection and we're still at risk potentially from the effects of global warming. Why is this important? So this is some analysis we've been doing and we've been doing some modeling work looking at uh, 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 trends in, in enteric diseases in Ho Chi Minh City. This is diarrheal cases in the hospitals that we work with and there was this <coughs> artifactual belief that actually that there was more diarrheal cases during periods of high rainfall. And actually you can see in these periods of high rainfall, actually there's a drop in diarrheal diseases. And then we looked in this in more detail. We actually found that the diarrheal cases actually correlated very nicely uh, with the river level around the city. So 
the city is actually uh, a tidal, so it's a tidal river, and what we find is that this is reproducible. We've gone back over the last 10, 15 years that diarrheal cases peak and trough with the rise and fall of the tides, uh, meaning that probably there's an association between the groundwater and its ability to mix sewage into the groundwater and the chances of being, the organisms being transmitted become greater. That's just uh, it's more data demonstrating quite a nice correlation between um, uh, river level and the number of diarrheal cases, but not between rainfall and, and also not between temperature. So this is something we're working on at the moment and we hope to have a very, very nice story. We have some more variables that we're looking at at the moment to see how diarrheal disease is peaking troughed with other kind of natural phenomena. So, Vietnam's in fairly substantial risk of global warming being as the vast majority of the southern part of the country is very low lying and will probably underwater in the next hundred years. So this is the next organism I'm going to talk about. This is my second favorite organism after Salmonella typhi. This is uh, Shigella. So Shigella, uh, the disease is commonly known as acute bacillary dysentery. There's estimated to be about 160 million cases a year. There's four different species, but something I'll mention a little bit later, there's a multiple, multitude of different genotypes in, in all of them apart from Shigella sonii. It's prevalent um, and common in, in developed and undeveloping countries, although it does circulate worldwide. The US sees a fair amount of Shigella infections annually. Uh, prevention and treatment, uh, we've, we've, to some extent, we've looked at all of these drugs and we're not really sure what effect they do or don't have on disease. We think they probably don't have a huge effect on disease, but we think they probably have an effect on carriage. And there's no vaccine for any one of these. There's been uh, effort, a lot of effort over the last 25 years to try and develop Shigella vaccines, but we're still incremental steps forward, but we're still not that close to having one licensed. Okay. So it's transmitted fecal orally. Common, uh, so waterborne and water washed. Again, like typhoid, humans are the only reservoir. Interestingly, for a, for a gram negative pathogen, it's got a really, really low infectious dose, the fewest 10 organisms. Uh, incubation period about one to three days. Uh, you can be symptomatic for up to two weeks and you can be infectious for up to four weeks. And like I said before, this may be reduced with antimicrobials. And the species is dependent on location. Um, Flexneri and Sonai are the major, major players. Shigella is actually really quite an interesting pathogen because it essentially all it is is a tooled up E. coli. So over a period of, of uh, uh, the, the last 50,000 years or so, non-invasive or bog standard commensal E. coli has gained a number of different virulence factors, plasmids, pathogenicity islands, also lost uh, the ability to, to interact with different organisms, lost flagelli, lost fimbrae in some catabolic pathways, and then we find Shigella. So this is imprinted genomically, so we can tell that E. coli and Shigella are actually very, very closely related. And all of the tricks are encoded, or the majority of them are encoded on this particular piece of DNA. This is a virulence plasmid. So every Shigella, Shigella isn't Shigella without this. This catalyzes the whole of the ability to cause uh, the organism to cause the infection. And its crowning glory is a, a type three secretion system, which secretes a number of different <coughs> effector proteins in, into, into host cells. Really, another elegant uh, evolutionary factor uh, of Shigella is that because it uh, doesn't have uh, flagella, it can't move, but it moves from cell to cell very efficiently. And the way it does this is by rearranging the actin cytoskeleton. So the red, the red blobs here are Shigella and green is actin. And what it does, it elongates and stretches actin between cells and actually uses the actin to actually uh, mobilize itself into adjacent cells. Incredibly clever. Well, clever is the, you know what I mean. Okay, so something I need to do before is Shigella sarnai and Shigella flexori. So two different uh, species of the same organism over a period of time. So this is data from the US from 1964 up to 1973. And you can see that fairly dramatically that Shigella flexori has gone down and down and Shigella sarnai has gone up and up and up. Now, we don't really understand why this occurs, but we think it's related to sanitation and some data. I've got that I'll show you that actually the same thing is going on elsewhere. But this is a really, really important for our ability to tackle the infection in, in a reason why I'll explain now. So this is uh, some work uh, that was done as part of a review by Mike Levine's group some time ago and published in, in uh, Nature Reviews Microbiology. 
looking at the different um, serotypes of Shigella flexneri, Shigella sani, Shigella boidii, Shigella dysenterii in South Asia, Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and East Asia and Pacific. Now, this is quite a lot of information to take in, and I appreciate, but this is probably the most important part. In Thailand, the vast majority of cases are caused by Shigella sani, and also you can see in Latin America, the vast, majority, the vast majority of cases are caused by Shigella sani. In other places, in Bangladesh and Pakistan, there's a huge diversity, some Shigella sani, but a range of different uh, uh, Shigella organisms. Whereas here, the dominant organism is Shigella sani, demonstrating that this transition has occurred in, in Thailand as well. There's a transition from Shigella flexneri to Shigella sani. And this has also happened in Vietnam. This is an old slide, we have a lot more data than this now, but there's also been a dramatic shift for Figella flexneri Shigella sani over the last 20 years. We presume it's associated with the change in uh, uh, economics, improvements in sanitation. However, there hasn't been any reduction in disease burden. We still see as many Shigella patients now as we did 20 years ago, but now they're infected with Shigella sani, whereas they used to be infected with Shigella uh, flexneri. Actually, this is wrong. It says more than 90% of the Shigella we isolate in Ho Chi Minh City are now sani. This isn't true. All of the Shigella we now isolate in, in Ho Chi Minh City are Shigella sani. This is a really, really horrible graph, but it basically shows there's been also a concurrent shift in antimicrobial resistance. So some of the organisms catalyzed by this drop down here, this, these are the antimicrobials, and then there's a the period of time is at the bottom. Uh, there's been a reversion to, to sensitivity to older antimicrobials and the emergent resistance to fluoroquinolones, and also, arguably more, more worryingly, the recent emergence of resistance to third generation cephalosporins. So change in species, Changing antimicrobial resistance patterns, this is clearly a dynamic organism uh, that's going through active evolution underneath our noses. The way I got involved in this project is because one of my master's students was working on this and we isolated this particular plasmid. Uh, it contains an extended spectrum beta lactamase. An extended spectrum beta lactamase, or ESBL, catalyzes resistance to um, beta lactams, particularly third generation cephalosporins. For those of you that are like me, that are interested in bacteriology, this is a really elegant uh, piece of DNA. But actually the only thing that we're particularly interested in here is this, this bright pink gene here, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, gene that catalyzes resistance to um, antimicrobials. The rest of it is just uh, to drive it around. The rest of it is just a conjugation system and replication proteins. So, when we're finding this, it's becoming increasingly common in all gram negatives that we now work on. These relatively sophisticated plasmids that only carry um, one or two resistance genes but catalyze resistance at really, really high levels to some really, some really important antimicrobials. It emerged in 2007, and by 2010, every organism that we isolated was resistant to third generation cephalosporins. And this is the particular group that it was encoded, and we found there was two different plasmids circulating. So I won't dwell too much on that. But I'll go back on to strain differentiation. So my background, like I said, is in genetic diversity and genomics. So Shigella e. coli with weapons. Chromosomally, they're very similar. Uh, the weapons are on mediate and plasmids. Yet, due to their limited host range, they form a subgroup, and the various species are, are closely related. So using a conventional uh, molecular um, genotyping tool called multilocus sequence typing, this is the whole of E. coli here. So this tells us that actually Shigella are really, really, uh, really, really um, an E. coli. And this is the Shigella ones up here in pink. So they form a little subset on this tree when we look at genetic diversity in some key housekeeping genes. Uh, but actually, they're, they're just E. coli. Now, if we, dive, if we study, say if we wanted to do a study about by the one I've just demonstrated in Nepal, that we wanted to look at genetic diversity, MLST only breaks our organisms down. This is the whole, this is all of the organisms isolated. This is about 400 Shigella over 15 years. And we only have uh, seven or eight sequence types. So there really isn't enough genetic diversity by doing conventional genotyping method to study uh, how the organisms are circulating. So what we did, we performed a genome sequencing project. So the advent of genome sequencing technology, next generation technology, allows us to sequence genomes at a very, very high rate, at a very high frequency, and a really high degree of accuracy. We knew that Shigella sani was emergent worldwide. We didn't know anything about the population structure. We don't know anything about how the plasma and the chromosome co-evolve. We don't really have any tools for local or international epidemiology, and we don't understand how antimicrobial resistance works. 
So we collected 132 different strains worldwide, isolated between 1943 and 2008 from four continents. And we identified the core and the accessory genome. And we used a tool, a uh, Bayesian uh, um, phylogenetic reconstruction package called BEAST to reconstruct the phylogeny. And this is the tree that you get. Here it says actually there's five lineages, but uh, four lineages, but there's three main lineages. Um, and what I want to uh, demonstrate is this particular group here, lineage three, is where all of the strains pretty much that we've isolated since the 1990s now circulate. And as you can see also, these particular groups are color-coded to where they're from, that you can see in particular locations, they clustered together. Demonstrating that we thought is what happening is when organisms become or get entered into a local country or a, a local human population, they stay within that human population and they evolve. Uh, this kind of flies in the face of other dogmas revolving around other gram-negative bacteria where you get international transfer quite regularly. What we think happens is when an organism becomes introduced into one place, then it becomes fixed in that place and then forms the population. So, quite interesting, something to follow up. We also noted, uh, this is um, looking at the branch lengths of the tree to try and uh, calculate evolutionary rates. These are the different lineages, slightly steeper curve with lineage three, meaning that it's mutating quicker and it's evolving faster. So also, because we can draw a straight line through these, we can actually date these relatively accurately. So we know how fast Shigella mutates. It mutates somewhere between three and four uh, mutations across the chromosome per year, which means that we can take any Shigella now, we can work out potentially not only where it's come from, but we can also date it back to our phylogenetic tree and work out how distantly or closely related it is, whether it's part of an epidemic and various other things. So using this phylogenetic structure, we've essentially created a tool which allows us to monitor what's going on with the population in any location we care. This is the data that I showed you before, just in a graph. This is the proportion of Shigella sani between four different periods. Uh, so 95, 96, 30% Shigella sani, and then almost 100% in 2010. Increasing resistance to third generation cephalosporins and also to, to quinolones. So then taking strains just from Vietnam, we did exactly the same study and we genome sequenced them and we created our own phylogenetic tree. This is where I'm based in Ho Chi Minh City in the south. And then we took samples from another province in Can Hoa and some samples from a province in central Vietnam called Hue. And we genome sequenced them and we created a phylogenetic tree. And using BEAST again, we reconstructed it. What we found is that we could date every organism that we'd isolated over the last 15 years back to one location at the start of the 1980s. Meaning that every organism now that we isolate and that we've ever isolated in Vietnam dates back from an original introduction of one organism, we think, somewhere around the 1980s, probably into the south of Vietnam. Even more interestingly than that is that it's formed its own specific population in Ho Chi Minh City. And then it's also, if you look at the way these are scattered around the tree, introductions from Ho Chi Minh City or organisms from Ho Chi Minh City have been introduced into these different locations and then these different locations have also formed their own subpopulations. So it seems there's a relatively big sink somewhere. So a big sink of organisms gets introduced into a location. They become fixed in that location and then they seed other locations. This is our map of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, this, uh, these pictures or these, these dots correlate with Shigella organisms that we sequenced. The yellow dots are the ones that have our um, ESBL gene, uh, resistance to third generation cephalosporin. Our um, grey dots are the ones that have resistance to fluoroquinolones and our white ones don't have resistance to either. The heat map uh, is a heat map of the diarrheal density uh, of the, of, um, sorry, the density of diarrheal infections in the city. And what you can see is uh, a relatively simple message that the majority of the genetic diversity and also the occurrence of new strains appears to arise in this particular location in Ho Chi Minh City. Now, the picture that I showed you earlier and the data that we use for measuring our tide uh, is here. So we think there's a fairly substantial correlation between the emergence of new Shigella strains and circulation in this particular environment. So we think that there probably that somewhere around this area there is a nursery for the introduction of new Shigella strains. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. From 265 isolates, this is what a clonal expansion looks like. 
organisms from 2000 to 2001 at the far end of the branches, organisms from 2002 to 2003, again further down these particular branches with this common backbone, 2005, 2007, again genetically related to these particular points but forming their own populations, and then in 2008, 2010, some distant strains but the population expansion continues onwards. So why is this important? How does this relate back to what we're seeing with respect to um, treatment and drug resistance? Well, before this period in 1994, uh, we know that all, uh, one organism picked up this particular plasmid in cold in a colicin. A colicin is a uh, protein that some gram-negative bacteria express to kill other gram-negative bacteria. So we think the addition of this particular colicin plasmid actually had a fairly dramatic effect on uh, hampering the rest of the bacterial population. And when we isolated this colicin and put it back onto uh, a plasmid so we could follow it and then uh, subjected it to different gram-negative bacteria and different Shigella, we found that it had a fantastic effect of killing every gram-negative bacteria we could put in it. Meaning that selective event of driving the first wave of Shigella infections in Vietnam was generated by not just one, but we found, latterly found two colicin plasmids, which had a really, really dramatic effect of killing other gram-negative bacteria, presumably in the gastrointestinal tract, allowing it to outcompete other organisms for micronutrients and various other uh, um, things that are available at the gastrointestinal surface. If we look at drug resistance, these are mutations uh, in the DNA gyrase gene. The DNA gyrase gene is the target for fluoroquinolones. And we found that these have occurred with some evidence of homoplasy, mutations occurring in different lineages and also in different locations which have a similar effect by reducing susceptibility to fluoroquinolone. However, one particular mutation pre-2003 in one organism then seeded the rest of the population, forming another selective sweep. So every organism that we've isolated before or around 2003 has this particular mutation in position 87 in the DNA gyrase, and all of them now have reduced susceptibility to fluoroquinolones. And we can take that one stage further because pre-2006, we now know that one particular organism inherited this ESBL plasmid encoding resistance to third generation cephalosporins, and then every, or every organism we isolated after 2006 until current day now carries resistance to fluoroquinolones and resistance to third generation cephalosporins. So demonstrating that antimicrobial pressure that we're inducing on the organisms by exposure through the environment or through treatment is having a really, really dramatic effect on shaping the population of the organism. We can take this one stage further and go back to our map and look at organisms that are isolated from these different locations scattered around our phylogenetic tree. We think that organisms are moving outside Ho Chi Minh City up the coast and we can see local uh, clonal populations like we could in Ho Chi Minh City. Well, we know that our strains in the south have inherited this particular plasmid which catalyzes resistance to third generation cephalosporins. This has also occurred in different locations. So this is uh, Can Hoa and about a third of the way up the coast. So their own isolated populations also now resistance to third generation cephalosporins, but by a, by a different gene and on a different plasmid. So beautiful evidence of selective pressure, homoplasy, organisms having the same um, phenotypic structure, but on the basis of a different uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance gene. We know also that our strains in the south have picked up this mutation that enhances resistance to fluoroquinolones. This has also occurred um, this is also, sorry, this has also occurred in Canhua. As you can see, it's a different mutation. So again, another beautiful example of selective pressure induced by antimicrobials that has an effect of homoplasy, whereby you have different mutations which have exactly the same phenotype. So what are we doing now? So part of the reason that I'm here to see Phil and his group is that what we're doing is to try and combat Shigella in a greater detail uh, we're about to enrol a thousand children from birth and follow them for three years to understand the incidence of the disease and how frequently uh, children are exposed to it and what the median age of seroconversion rate is for children that live in the city. We're doing this by um, also recruiting over 5,000 children with dysentery. We're looking at the epidemiology and hopefully we'll be performing more genomics 
but also uh, through a collaboration here by looking at serology, we're trying to identify new antigens uh, that hopefully may lead us down a more um, sensible approach for gelivertipine and a vaccine. And the particular place of our cohort study is going to be the location where we think our nurseries of Shigella infections occur. So we, we hopefully we can find some age-specific incidents. Uh, we can look in greater detail at the local evolution and also the, the, the geography. Uh, also the longitudinal immune response of understanding how the immune system matures after exposure to the organism. And we hope to develop novel vaccine and diagnostics candidates. I think I've spoken for enough. This all wasn't done by me. This is a fraction of what we do. And this is uh, uh, not all in my group, but the vast, the vast majority of them are. Uh, last Christmas, stood outside our, our building. And um, particularly, uh, I want to say a particular thanks to this guy here, who is our resident genomics expert. This is a guy called Yui Fan, who's uh, very talented. So this is my group. I just have to say that I'm funded by the Royal Society and the Wellcome Trust through her Sir Henry, Hale, Sir Henry Dale Fellowship. And we have five minutes, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions you wish to ask. Thank you very much. Well, I asked my question, and I think you may have clarified it, but then I got confused again. It's about the relationship between rainfall yes. and the incidence of, um, I think it's a salmonella. Uh, That's right, yeah. In, in the first graph, there seemed to be a correlation, and I thought that yeah. was intuitive because... So, in, water, yeah, in Nepal, yeah. there's absolutely a correlation between rainfall and uh, salmonella infections. So, Nepal is landlocked, and it's in the Himalayas, and actually, uh, you'd, unbelievably, considering how much melt they get from the Himalayas, they have a real problem with water shortages and they have a, a, a fairly intense wet season. And we think that what happens is that as the groundwater fills up, then it pushes fecal matter into the, into the, um, the, sanitation, into the, uh, the water flow systems. In Ho Chi Minh City, the opposite is true. We don't really understand why diarrhea drops in, in high rainfall, but because it's tidal, we think that the effect of the tide is actually um, increasing the groundwater to such a point where it gets saturated and then there's drainage problems and you get poor sanitation. So two completely contrasting things that are occurring in two completely contrasting areas. That's an excellent question. We don't know. Um, so antimicrobials are uh, freely available to buy over the counter in all of the locations that we work in. So I, it's very unusual for me to come to America or the US, uh, to the UK, and if I get sick, not to be able to buy antimicrobials. And everybody does. So everybody takes antimicrobials pretty much all the time. Now, whether that is driving that, or whether it's a treatment pressure, or whether it's just a general then I don't know. But I think that actually what's happening is that because just due to the overuse of antimicrobials in farming and in medicine and everywhere, that actually we're generating more and more drug-resistant commensals. And I think that probably this is an artifact of that whereby they're, they're picking up drug resistance genes just to compete with other commensal organisms that also have similar uh, capacity to be resistant to antimicrobials. We've done a study and we found that um, something like 65% of um, Vietnamese children had ESBL producing E. coli just living up their bum. So, and we don't really know how that correlates with disease, but we think that probably that selective pressure is just due to constant exposure to antimicrobials. Yes? Uh, so you did the uh, whole genome sequencing for Shigella. Yes. So fairly elegant uh, clonal expansion. Uh, you didn't observe that for Taiki. What kind of data have you used for? Okay, so uh, actually, <laughs> I know more about the genome. I know more about the genomics of Typhi than I do about Shigella, actually. So, Typhi is also a clonal population, um, but it's been around for a lot longer. 
and it's not as well defined. So Typhi does not have um, a consistent mutation rate. It forms isolated populations, however, the ancestors still exist. Um, so it'd be quite, it's quite confusing to do phylogenetic reconstruction on Typhi because unless you have a particular area where you can measure an independent strain, then you can't do it because it's like measuring your family tree but your ancestors still living and not being able to separate from you. So there's this belief, and it's certainly true for some bacteria and almost every virus, that they have a constant mutation rate. Uh, there's some, sure, there's some recombination and other events going on, but actually you can work out what's what and you can create a phylogenetic tree that's got some temporal association. With typhoid, you can't do it uh, because it's uh, hampered by having a number of different older genotypes, we think, circulating that it doesn't allow us to calculate the genetic distance accurately. But did you actually use whole genome sequencing? Yeah, so the data that I showed you was a combination of uh, targeting a number of different SNPs that we know allow us to infer phylogenetic structure and genome sequencing. And uh, can you comment on the evolutionary rate of uh, Shigella versus uh, Titan? Um, yes, so we know that Shigella evolves very rapidly at about four mutations of the chromosome per year. In some locations where we have found isolated populations of Typhi, we estimate that probably it's a lot less than that. Uh, maybe a mutation or two every two to three years. Um, but that's not consistent because, like I say, um, the ancestors still circulate. So if you were to find a strain uh, now with a number of mutations that appear to be related to another strain that was circulating 10 years ago, the strain that was circulating 10 years ago may also still be circulating. So you've got no way of doing accurate phylogenetic reconstruction. Yes? Uh, do you have an idea why the strains H3P8 and H3P8G are more spread than the other ones? Or if, uh, I was wondering, uh, have you ever done some relationship between the spread and the profile of the Okay, um, so we've just published a paper um, before uh, Christmas um, looking at um, different mutations in the DNA gyrase gene. And we found that if you do a, a competitive uh, growth assay in the laboratory, that the drug resistant strains outgrow naturally their parents. Um, and we have some idea why that occurs. So, meaning that if they have a mutation in the DNA gyrase, there's a selected advantage even in the absence of antimicrobials. So we think that probably they just grow better, but also, and something that we're trying to do, but it's, it's quite a difficult experiment, is uh, looking at epistasis interactions between different, um, uh, different uh, nucleotide changes around the chromosome. So what we think is that basically the H58 genotype essentially has a multitude of different epistatic interactions which seem to make it spread faster than others. And I think that it's not purely being driven by fluoroquinolone resistance, but there's other things which allow it to be either transmitted or replicate faster than other strains. It definitely has a selected advantage and we don't really understand why. Thank you. Do these um, subpopulations, do they behave like serotypes? In other words, if you have to one population, will they <coughs> neutralize the other? Yeah, so Shigella son is only one serotype. Um, so if you have antibody to a Shigella we isolated from the north of Vietnam, you will theoretically be immune to Shigella in the south. Um, if you're infected with a Shigella son there is some evidence of uh, heterotypic immunity to other Shigella serotypes, but it's not solid, meaning that the majority of the uh, protective immunity is associated with actually the, the O-antigen of Shigella, which is why developing a vaccine uh, for a multitude of different Shigella might be complicated because there's so many different serotypes. Yes? I wasn't too clear on, um, and I think you might have mentioned it, but I might have missed it, um, the household dynamics that are taking place like, yeah. in Nepal, yeah. where you're more likely to get infected with... Um, yeah, so the, dog, so the dogma goes that um, one of the main transmission routes uh, for typhoid is coming in contact with somebody that's acutely sick in close proximity. So we know there's risk factors for typhoid are living in a house with uh, a, a small amount of space and a large amount of people and having an index case, but also through contact with an asymptomatic carrier. So we think that somewhere between three, five, maybe a little bit more percent of people that have had typhoid 
go on to be asymptomatic carriers for a period up to 20, 30 years. So if you live or are in close proximity with that individual, you increase your risk of getting sick. So our household data demonstrates that if you have an index case with a particular genotype, uh, then there is a chance of getting sick with the same genotype. However, you're still more likely to get sick with another organism, meaning that even if the pressure is coming from within the household, that transmission cycle is, is within the household, you're still more likely to get sick from an, an exogenous source. And why do you think that is? Because people are drinking contaminated water in different amounts at different times, and every time they drink the water, they're playing kind of salmonella roulette, I think, probably. <laughs> Okay. So once upon a time, fig, bacterial fig piping was used yeah. reliably, but I think that age has passed. But I wondered if fig are still important in moving, well, in mixing the, the genes, but also specifically about the antibiotic resistance uh, genes. And I don't know if you have an update on what the status of this is. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, so I spent a lot of time working on bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are a microbiologist's dream, yeah. Um, so what, what I will say is that um, we have some very, very preliminary data. And uh, we know that uh, with cholera, there's a fairly substantial effect of bacteriophage in the water, which seem to control the population at different points. And we think the same might be true for typhi. We think that actually there might be uh, changes in the, our ability to isolate typhi-specific bacteriophage at different points in the year. So it may control the population in the environment. With respect to drug resistance, um, there's very little evidence that bacteriophage are playing a role uh, in inducing drug resistance. So they're plasmid-borne. Uh, they may be associated with recombinases or IS elements, which may facilitate it, but there's no um, elements that we found that, are, that, that appear to be drug resistance that are induced by bacteriophage. However, we do know that in both Typhi and in Shigella that the biggest um, effect on the architecture of the genome is still being driven by bacteriophage. So bacteriophage have a fairly dramatic effect on changing the structure of the genome, uh, but we don't really know, with the exception of two or three nice examples, um, what, what they're doing. Yeah. This observation that um you're making that Shigella can secrete an antibiotic that actually uh, uh, kills very closely related strains. Yeah. We, the, the first time we were informed about that was uh, in the Burkholderia area. I don't know if you've, you uh, were uh, aware of this thing. It, it, the Burkholderia grows in the, in the rice fields, in the, in the mud. And uh, actually one, uh, strain can be found in about a 10 square meter area and then you can move beyond that 10 square meter area and then there's another pure strain in that uh, particular uh, area and it's all mediated by this type of a, a secreted antibiotic that is, is able to uh, kill uh, even these very closely related strains. Is that, do you think that's a similar uh, thing here that you're Showing yeah, sure. So that, I think it is very similar. The, 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 only, the only differences between them that we've actually screened uh, a longitudinal collection of Shigella sonai, and uh, even the newer strains have immunity to the old um, colicin. So it's not specific to the organism that we isolate, but it's specific to Shigella sonai, which means if you have that plasmid and you have an immunity gene with it, that makes you then immune to that colicin, regardless of whether it was isolated 10, 15 years ago. However, we've done it against strains isolated before that period and to other Shigella, and it, it definitely has a, a fairly dramatic effect. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.